situation. Ambassador Josette, part of the story of how EVs will, will spread around the world has a lot to do with geopolitics. And I cover OPEC uh, for, uh, for energy intelligence. I've done it for over a decade, and they always call it the cartel when it comes to the oil industry. So walk us through how the supply chains could be politicized in, in terms of the EV. Um, what are the risks here? Well. The title of this panel is Are Bumpy Roads Ahead for EVs and Supply Chains? And I would say bumpy roads have been the entire journey to launching this new industry, this new way of mobility. <laughs> Countries are involved. Uh, this is very important for Europe. It's important for Asia, for China, for the U.S. to really stand up this next generation of automobile mobility. Uh, and the supply chains haven't been mature, and they're subject to the same pressure that all supply chains have been subject to, including the politicization of the supply chains, the fears over single sourcing, and the need for diversification. I, I just want to start, though, really uh, complimenting our hosts here. Um, I've spent a lot of time really looking at the capacity for new entrants into the supply chain, and I think EVs allow for that because it's an immature supply chain network, so the barriers to entry are pretty low. And the kingdom has invested a lot to stand up the R&D. But I was at El Faisalia University, and they have a, a group of women, uh, young women en engineers there who have stood up a solar car. Um, they're on fire to be part of this new future of mobility. Mm. I love seeing that. I love seeing it at the at CAST, at KAUST, at all these centers for R&D here. So we're hopeful that we could see the Gulf region be a participant in the supply chains. Uh, we're buying our windshields from Peru. That's a new entrant into the supply chains. Um, and really involving new developing markets in this. Um, but I think we have a bumpy road ahead, even though it's smoothing out a bit after COVID. Ambassador, sorry, just to follow up on that, is there a realization by the U.S. that supply chains and mass supply chains exist in China? I mean, in terms of EV uh, penetration, I think it's the highest globally. So is this something that, I mean, um, U.S. policymakers have at the back of their mind when they're thinking about EV and supply chains? It is, and if you look at the infrastructure bill that went through Congress, for example, in the Department of Energy, there's a $400 billion loan package just to pour into really electrification of mobility and all that potential. So everything from critical minerals to battery production and all of that. Um, this um, is unprecedented. Having said that, the ability to actually have a complete supply chain, um, one that isn't dependent on what much of the U.S. auto industry has been, which is China sourcing, mm -hmm. uh, is something that's going to require a lot more than putting loans on the table. It's skill set, it's uh, education and R&D, and also the willingness to stand up the, that workforce in America. Glad you brought that up. It's affordability, Ambassador, at the end of the day. What's going to improve that affordability aspect? Is it better technology? Is it um, more sophisticated uh, engines, batteries, etc.? What's going to bring the price down? So it's affordability, it's reliability, it's range, it's all of these things that I think the R&D has been improving the scope of those, including lower service and maintenance costs for these vehicles. Uh, there are virtually no fluids to change. The maintenance is a much lower burden. Um, for um, in the US, it's standardization also of some of the basic equipment. So if you look at all the diversification in batteries, at some point the market will rationalize. And right now the US government is, has a competition to choose the battery module standard. My company is one of two finalists for that. Once a standard is set, it tends to flow through the industry and help standardize the charging networks and the um, ability to replace and repair these battery modules, the safety aspects of them, which are you know, a big issue. So I think as we see some standardization in this, you know, what is now really a, a burgeoning new market, um, it will help get costs down. Um, but also, you know, I just do want to emphasize 
diversifying the supply chain and bringing new entrants in. It's why we're working with innovative companies like Olean Group here to really look at how we rationalize a global supply chain. Mm -hmm. And um, also we have reduced at our company the number of parts in the vehicle to 1,800 mm -hmm. from a typical of 6,000, 7,000. When, when software can do a lot of the burden that hardware used to do, it also can ultimately reduce costs. So I think the promise of EVs is that we can have a much more efficient mobility market. It can help, I agree, um, that this can help build microgrids. It can help diversify our power grid structure done right because of the investment. Um, I think it's all good. About five years from now, the, the road will be a lot less bumpy. <laughs> oh, that's great to hear. Um, but when, and excuse me if this is like a naive question, but when it comes to the energy transition and EVs, um, I'm based out of Dubai, for example, and many of my friends have Teslas. When they charge their cars, this power is still coming from hydrocarbons somehow. So do you think that EVs have potential in advancing the transition? Uh, they do, because they're really neutral as far as the source goes. So in the U.S., a state like Oklahoma is an oil state, but almost half of its power are from renewables, mm -hmm. from wind and solar. Mm -hmm. You can plug an EV into any power source. Mm -hmm. The main problem is you can't just use old grids that are already overtaxed in places like California that have a huge mandate for adoption. One statistic that's interesting is the U.S. government requires any government agency in the U.S. that purchases a vehicle after 2027 for it to be an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. About 2% of the supply approved for the U.S. government right now are electric vehicles. This mandate's about to hit. There is not a charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There are many innovative, we're doing one, sources of micro charging networks that you can drop in. But the gap between the mandates and the demands in places like Europe and China and the US and uh, the entire supply chain operation right now is massive mm -hmm. and I think causing some troubles and disruption along the way. Excellent. We're running out of time, but I have one last question um, for all of you. Um, in an ideal world, what would make this EV r bumpy ride less bumpy? Can you give me just a few things that need to change? Thanks, Ambassador. If I had to pick one thing, I'd say battery cell density, which I think over the next five to 10 years will be near nuclear strength. We'll, we'll be able to move past this debate about range anxiety. <coughs> and once that happens and we get the safety of the battery systems up, this is what has blocked electrification. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what the first electric vehicle was that I've been able to find in human history? Tell us, please. You won't know. <laughs> so Henry Ford's wife did not want to crank the car. So she demanded her husband put an electric motor in okay. so that the old, the first Ford uh, automobile would crank with the electric motor. Why has it taken all this time for something so logical to come into mobility? It takes and I think, a woman to discover it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> like everything and, else. And the women, you know, transition the washing machines to electrification, all of that. But um, I think it makes sense. It's a perfect fit for mobility. It's better for survivability, for safety, for maintenance, for the planet, for its 25% of carbon emissions. But it's always been this challenge with the battery density, the ability to pull enough power out with the weight and the payload to move into heavier trucks, longer distances. Um, so to me, that would be the one thing that we have to do. Uh, we feel there's so much promise, even if you think of humanitarian zones mm -hmm. or first responders, if you can send in autonomous vehicles with food, supplies, rescue operations, if you can utilize this technology in ways that really have been you know, challenging and dangerous, um, we're all for it. So it's, it's uh, but batteries would be my choice.